Thank you, Hasib, for coming on and joining me on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, you've got a super interesting story, starting dropping out of school, playing some poker for a while, then got into tech, and then really went down the rabbit hole with crypto. And now you're managing partner of Dragonfly Capital. You guys recently raised $650 million for Fund 3, so congrats on that. I think Thank for those who, who don't know you, uh, best place to get started is just with your story. And uh, as always, sort of the earlier willing to start and uh, talking about some of the decisions you made along the way to to get to where you are today would be great. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me, Jake. Uh, my backstory, it's a somewhat circuitous one. So I, as you mentioned, I got my start um, before I ever got into crypto or the tech industry. I used to be a professional poker player. Did that for five years from when I was 16 years old until I turned 21. Uh, when I was 19, I was ranked one of the top 10 online no limit hold'em players in the world. Uh, made a lot of money at a young age. Made a lot of mistakes. Learned a lot. Um, it was a it was a strange way to grow up. Probably <laughs> definitely not a traditional adolescence when it comes to learning things. Uh, often people try to. It, it, it's hard not to notice that there are a lot of folks who came up in poker who end up finding their way into crypto. And I think it's for a good reason. There's a lot of crossover between poker and crypto. One of them, I, you know, I knew a lot of, of my buddies who got into Bitcoin very early, uh, in large part because after 2011, uh, so online poker went through this uh, event called Black Friday, when the Department of Justice shut down a bunch of off -sea or offshore uh, online poker sites. And as a result, there were a lot of poker sites that popped up that people wanted to play high stakes games with, but they couldn't settle in dollars because you, you know, no longer really had access to the US dollar banking system if you wanted to play uh, online poker. So uh, there were these sites that popped up that would settle in Bitcoin. And this is very, very early on, like 2012, 2013, I think. Uh, and so I knew a lot of folks who got into Bitcoin very early because of that, who had origins in the poker world. But there's a deeper connection, I think, between poker and crypto, which is that they're both... Um, they're both weird. They're both areas where if you are dedicating your life or career or the way you make money to something that's kind of subversive, kind of esoteric, sort of cuts you off from a lot of normal people, at least back in the day, crypto is a lot more normalized now. But you know, back when I first got into it and when a lot of folks who really were early came into it, um, it was a bunch of weirdos. And it was something that uh, you know, didn't seem respectable, didn't seem like a traditionally impressive area to be dedicating your career or your time to. Um, but it's one that ended up paying off. And if you're not afraid of looking stupid or looking strange, um, you could have made a lot of money getting into the space and uh, becoming an expert at it. And so that's one thing I think that is very common between poker and crypto. Um, and then, of course, your attitude towards risk. Coming into crypto, crypto has never been a sure thing. And there are a lot of people who sort of try to claim, like, look, I knew it all along. And, you know, I, I never had a doubt in my mind whether crypto was going to work. And, um, you know, I, I, I at least am not one of those people, and, and I don't believe most people who claim that they are built that way. Uh, crypto has had a lot of tough moments. There have been a lot of dark nights of the soul in trying to make this a career and dedicating yourself to this. And um, luckily, it's paid off, and we've been very fortunate that uh, we, in some sense, picked the right horse. But um, the attitude towards risk and being willing to take big risks with your career, betting on something that you believe in, um, it's something that you, you uh, poker really taught me to do. Um, I think I have a relationship and attitude towards taking risks that most people really struggle to have. Um, so anyway, I, I got my start as a poker player. Eventually, uh, quit poker at 21. Uh, went back to school. Uh, when I when I was in school at the time, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I wrote a book about my uh, about what I learned as a poker player called uh, the philosophy of poker. That book ended up being a bestseller, the number one bestseller on Amazon for poker for like almost half a year. Uh, I then gave away all the money I'd made as a poker player, left myself with $10,000 and uh, decided that I was going to reinvent myself and do something different with my life. Uh, I came out to Silicon Valley, learned how to code. I went to a coding boot camp actually, because in school I didn't study anything technical. Um, I uh, eventually got a job as a software engineer at Airbnb where I was working on payments fraud. Uh, ironically, I was actually working on the same team that Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, was working on uh, when he left to go co-found Coinbase. Hmm. Um, I, obviously, I wasn't on the team at the same time as he was, but uh, I actually worked on some of his code. There's something and, in, in that department. 
Sorry, what was that? There's something in the water in that department. That is definitely true. That is definitely true. I mean, working on anti-fraud really teaches you how to think adversarially, which is a core part of how to think about and understand and analyze crypto. Uh, and so it, it, it kind of, it, it hit a lot of parts of my brain that I was already well suited for. And, and poker does the same thing, right? Poker, you're constantly thinking about what can my opponent have? How could they trick me? How could they break my strategy? Um, and crypto forces you to think that way as well, because security and you know, adversarial game theoretic equilibria is a part and parcel of what makes crypto crypto. Uh, and so it was while I was at Airbnb that um, I really caught the crypto bug and I became convinced that this stuff was going to change the world and that I wanted to be a part of it and I wanted to dedicate my career to it. So this was early 2017 uh, and uh, it was, I then did some cybersecurity research me and a buddy of mine discovered a security vulnerability in a protocol called Bancor. It's one of the very first DeFi protocols on Ethereum. I then went to a company called 21, which became Earn.com, which got acquired by Coinbase. Then I started my own startup, working on a stablecoin, uh, when I ended up getting recruited by Naval Ravikant to come on the investing side. So I got my start as a, at a fund called Metastable Capital. And then a little while afterwards, I came on board to Dragonfly where I've been ever since. And uh, as you mentioned, we've raised a few funds. We've done pretty well. We've been early and active investors into a bunch of core stuff in crypto. We were early investors into Avalanche, Near Protocol, uh, Compound, MakerDAO, One Inch, Bybit, Anchorage, DYDX, Gem, uh, kind of all across the stack. We've made a bunch of early and, and uh, now seemingly prescient investments into crypto. Um, and uh, we're, still, we're still grinding, still doing our thing. Yeah, it's great. And I appreciate the uh, the overview. Going back to when you were first, you know, you dropped out of school to, to pursue poker full time. I think there's something to be said for, you know, if you want sort of an extraordinary outcome, you have to start doing extraordinary things. And there might be something to be said for just doing things differently, whether it's even better or worse, just doing things differently from the start. And you mentioned like, you know, similarities between crypto and poker, both kind of weird, very untraditional way to sort of develop by going on the poker tour as opposed to, you know, going through college and things like that. Did you feel like you got value out of just doing something different, regardless of sort of the quality of that different thing? Very much so. Although poker is, uh, you know, I often look at envy with people who, you know, started a startup when they were 18 or something like that, because <laughs> poker, poker teaches you, um, there are some valuable skills that I think you get as a poker player, like, you know, your attitude towards risk, your way to think about probabilities, your um, just, just a general um, call it courage. I think that poker uh, requires of you in order to be really good at it. Um, but there are a lot of things about poker that kind of suck, right? It's a, it's a very isolating profession. Um, you know, there, there, we used to have a, a saying is that, um, you know, in poker, poker is famously very high volatility, right? You make money, you lose money, you have ups and downs, you have all these swings. Obviously, trading crypto is like that. I mean, just owning crypto is like that. Uh, but uh, it's very, very emotionally challenging. And the one thing about it that's unique is that you're, it's also a solo enterprise. So at least with crypto, it's like all your crypto buddies, you know, everybody who's with you on this journey, we're all feeling it together and we're in the same boat. Uh, whereas in poker, you go through an upswing, you go through a downswing, and it's only for you. Nobody else is experiencing that thing with you. And most of the time, people don't care because they're like, look, they have their own problems. They're not, they're not here to commiserate with you about your problems. And, uh, and so there, there's an old saying in poker that um, uh, is it the people who care don't understand. And the people who understand don't care. Mm. And so, you know, the, your, your friends and family are like, oh my God, you lost, you know, $50,000. It's so terrible. And it's like, no, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Like it, it's fine. You know, it, it happens. Um, and even when you lose a lot of money, they're just horrified. They're mortified. It's like, look, that's not the response that I need. And the people who really get it, the other poker players, they're mostly like, look, don't tell me about your downswings. Let me tell you about mine. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like this kind of, this kind of, you know, almost like uh, emotional horse trading. Um, and so that makes it very emotionally challenging. Um, you don't have the sense of like being on a team that you do in uh, most other enterprises. And so that's it's one thing I think it, it develops a thick skin. It, it makes you learn to manage your own emotions, your own psychology. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult rite of passage relative to almost anything else that, that I've done in my life. Um, and I think that that was one of the big uh, lessons or, or gifts, I would say, that I got from my career as a poker player. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's obviously there's like team sports and things you do as part of a team, whether it's building a company or whatever it might be. Obviously, a lot of people start companies with a co-founder versus being a solo founder. But even in like a sport like golf, like not a team sport, right? You're still on the tour and people are mostly friendly. You can sort of commiserate with each other. I think there's a lot of sort of known benefits of like going through big ups and downs as, as a part of a team or with a group sort of suffering sort of builds bonds and things like that. But having gone through those ups and downs on your own with poker, you sort of mentioned like getting control over your emotions a little bit over time. Was that or, or what were some of the key sort of, um, you know, tangible takeaways that, that you think you got from having to endure sort of unimaginable, you know, ups and downs just totally on your own? And, and not only that, but, you know, you're 16 years old, you're 17 years old, um, not really like you haven't really been dropped into the world yet when you're sort of having to confront these things. That's right. I mean, there's there's nothing quite like uh, you know going to bed after losing half of your net worth and just feeling you know like like I, I I've had that experience at like 17, 18, 19 years old the multiple times, and um, this this just uh, this sinking feeling in your gut that like oh my god I can't believe what I've just done like months of my life have just been completely wiped out in a single night of bad decisions, and you you just learn that it's going to be okay. And then I'll wake up tomorrow and it's going to suck. And then the day after that, I'll kind of get used to it. And the day after that, I won't even remember that this happened. And I'll just be in this new place ready to move forward and to go do the next thing. And so you learn just by collecting enough bruises, really, that, um, that human beings are resilient. Like we're, we're, we're built to be able to survive hardship um, because we, we, we were adapted to do that. I mean, if we didn't, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have survived in our lineage. And so, you know, my, I guess the, the biggest takeaways for me is not even, not even that poker made me stronger or that poker made me more resilient, but poker made me realize how resilient I already am. And, um, you know, people often ask like, okay, how, how do you become more emotionally resilient? How do you become emotionally stronger at, at uh, weathering volatility or, or hardships? And, um, there is no like, there's no technique that poker teaches you. It's like, oh, if you do this, if you recite this mantra, if you you know, make these propitiations, then then you won't feel bad. Uh, the answer is that you will feel bad. You know, if you lose a lot of money, if you make a bad decision, if you mess things up, you're gonna feel crappy about yourself. Um, but what poker teaches you is that yeah, this too will pass. Like you you just have to bear through it. You have to understand that you have to feel your emotions and get past them. Um, there there is no choice to be able to suppress your emotions. That's not a thing. Nobody is, is um, nobody who, who does challenging and difficult things gets through it by suppressing what they feel. They get through it by feeling what they feel and then moving on. Uh, and that, that I think was the, one of the big lessons for me that um, poker gave me at a relatively young age. And I think what, what I've noticed after leaving poker that I've been able to do much more effectively than other people, not even looking at investing. Um, it's just the ability to realize that like, hey, I should do X and then doing it. And that follow through, just like, look, you, 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 you look coldly or clearly or rationally at a situation, you decide what the best thing to do is, and then you do it. And what I found is that it's, it's surprisingly really hard for a lot of people to just do those simple steps. A lot of people can identify what the right thing to do is. I mean, if you can't identify the right thing to do, then you know, th that's a deeper problem. But if you can identify the right thing to do, a lot of people can't pull the trigger. They can't say, okay, great. Then I'm going to say goodbye to my friends and family and go move to this new country. Or I'm going to quit my career and go start this new one. Or I'm going to, you know, blah, 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 whatever that thing is. But like, you look at the evidence and you decide what the right thing to do is. The follow through is really hard for people. And I think one thing that poker taught me is that trust your judgment. Trust your analysis. If you think it's the right thing to do, just go and do it and don't look back. Uh, that skill, poker teaches you to do that over and over and over again. Every hand of poker you play, you have to, you have to rationally look at what is the right thing to do, and then you have to do it. And the step of just doing it is the hardest one, and it's what most people fail at. Um, and that is, to be honest, what I credit a lot of my career success to. Because I, you know, when coming into investing or coming into crypto, um, you know, I didn't come in with a tremendous amount of advantages, right? Or even coming to the tech industry. I didn't, I, like, I didn't study anything technical. I had this weird ass background as a professional poker player. 
I, you know, I came to it at a relatively late age because I spent so much time dicking around as a poker player. Um, you know, I graduated, I think it took me seven years end to end before I finally graduated from college. Uh, I went to a state school, studied liberal arts. I studied English and philosophy in school. Um, and so everything that I have done since then has been a progress, has been, a pro, uh, has been attributable to me just figuring out the right thing to do and doing it. You know, it's not because I have some tremendous advantage or that I have connections or that I have anything else like that. Just that I figured out the right thing to do and I did it over and over and over again. And that's, you know, I, I don't know, it sounds trite, but uh, that is really the way that I see the path to success. Yeah, no, I think the uh, the emphasis on the doing it once you figured it out is, is super important. And like you said, like it's sort of surprising. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not perfect in this dimension by any means, far from it. But I think there's, it is just surprising to see like, it's actually not that hard to figure out what's like basically right, you know, like, in, in when it comes to like health, for example, right, like exercise, like, don't overeat by a ton, like don't smoke, there's a few things that are just like, obviously, or more or less, like, obviously correct. And mm -hmm. you don't really need to like, spend a ton of time figuring out like, the delta between like eating, you know, white rice or brown rice or whatever, like, you don't have to figure out, you know, deep, deep, like 99th percentile smartest person on like what to eat. You just need to like do the 80% thing that sort of gets you there. And, and a lot of people just don't do it. Um, and I think tr trying to like, you know, the excuse that you need to figure out a little bit of a better plan, like a incrementally better thing to do, just sort of hold, holds a lot of people back from just doing the thing that they just know is right. Uh, and you just sort of put that off forever. Um, when you were, you know, first of all, there's, there's an excellent podcast out there, so we won't dig into it too far, but you spoke with someone, uh, someone with relatively few podcasts. I forget who it was and I forget the name, but if you search Hasib's name and risk, I think it, it should come up and you guys talked a lot about risk and, and how you view, um, you know, uh, like so, sort of expanding more on this point that we've talked about how poker built your risk tolerance and how people need to take more risk and, and things like that. But I'm curious, one, one thing that wasn't sort of discussed is, is there anything that you do now that has sort of stuck with you as like a practical you know, a, an actual practice that, that people can sort of take and copy in terms of either a, you know, like imagining the worst case scenario, like Tim Ferriss has a pretty good thing on this where you sort of forecast mm -hmm. what's the worst thing that could actually happen. And it tends to be sort of, and then, you know, how could I mitigate that, et cetera. Um, and it tends to be a lot less bad than sort of your just like very ambiguous imagination of like, oh, everything would be terrible. And like, there's no coming back from this. Uh, and then secondarily to that, just things that you might do to like increase the small risks that you take day in and day out and just make sure that you sort of keep exercising that risk and, you know, willingness to fail sort of muscle. So that's a good question. And I, I think I have spoken at some point before, I don't remember when, but uh, I have spoken at some point before about the idea of looking at the downside and almost always the downside is less than most people think it is, especially for, especially for the kind of folks who are listening to a podcast like this. Chances are, your your downside, unless you're, I don't know, you're like insider trading or something, then okay, maybe there's a big downside uh, that's worth mitigating. But for most things in life, um, it's actually really easy to come back from things that you would think would be very difficult to recover from, right? Like you go make a career switch or you go, you know, uh, make a bet on some new industry and it doesn't work out. It's like, yeah, you can just go back to the thing you were doing before. Like it's not a big deal. Um, you, you waste, you lost maybe, you know, half a year's worth of wages or, something like that, which like, you can absolutely recover from and just you know, spend less this year. So um, the other thing that people tend to underestimate is their ability to habituate. So I think a lot of people really believe that, um, I mean, maybe not intellectually, but they sort of believe it intuitively, that once they get used to a certain thing, that they can't not, get, not be used to it anymore. And you know, one thing, that, one, thing one most ironclad thing that we know about human beings is that they habituate crazy fast. Meaning that when you enter into a new environment or your circumstances change, you get used to that new level very quickly. And it just becomes, you know, it just blends into the background and you stop even noticing it. And um, I think that if you understand that about human behavior and about yourself, it becomes a lot easier to take risks that, are, that may result in a material change in your day-to-day -day life because of the fact that you know with some confidence that if you make a big change, you'll probably just get used to it in, within like a couple of weeks. It's not 
going to be this like catastrophic every single day. You're going to feel the fact that you live in a smaller house or you're, you know, eating less fancy food or you're blah, blah, I don't know, all this stuff that people are, once they have, they're terrified to lose. And um, I think that's one of the biggest things that holds people back is that um, when you are looking at the risk, like, yeah, there's a risk that like you might lose money or you might make less money or you might be less assured that you get X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's like, if you think back to the times in your life when things really did go south and shit really did hit the fan, most of the time, like you were fine, you adapted, right? you dealt with it, you, you were okay. And uh, having confidence in your ability to habituate to different circumstances is, I think, one of the biggest things that gives you the license to take more risks in your life that are going to end up paying off in the long run. The other thing I'd say is that, you know, if, if you are in the practice of taking risks, I mean, step one for most people is like, just take more risks and take more intelligent risks. When I say take more risks, I don't mean like, you know, go, uh, you know, play roulette or uh, just, you know, go bet your life's worth on individual names in the stock market. I mean, more like take risks with your work, with your life, with your energy, with your uh, attention. And, um, and, you know, take risks within your relationships, you know, establish new boundaries, build new friendships with people who you didn't think that you could make friends with. And um, in reality, like you said, the downside is usually very limited, right? You go reach out to some very impressive person that you are tangentially connected to. And the most likely risk is that they just don't respond to your email or they don't respond to your message. And it's like, okay, well, who cares? What, what materially changed in the world? Nothing. Uh, that, that paralysis is the first thing that most people can't get over. But then the second level, once you are somebody who, can, who, who is actually uh, willing and capable of taking risks on a regular basis, then I think that the next level that most people don't do well enough is once you are, are attuned to taking risks, most people are not sufficiently patient. And that is one thing that I learned actually a lot from Naval um, is, you know, if you are looking for your next opportunity, you're looking for your next big thing or the next thing to take a leap on, uh, most people are too anxious to really sit down and wait for the right opportunity. They will say like, shit, I got to do something. Like I, I, I want to like pick my thing or I want to like whatever. And they'll say, okay, this is the first thing that passes my bar. So I'm going to go do it. Instead of saying like, look, if I just wait like three months or whatever, you know, some period of time and I don't just pick the first thing that passes my bar, but instead I wait and I see what is the best thing that, that comes across my table within the next three months, there's a really good chance that the best thing you see over those three months is much better than the first thing you'll see that passes your bar. And that general principle of just being patient and allowing yourself to see the nature of opportunities that come your way um, is one of the biggest things that really successful people do much better than people who are moderately successful. So that, that's the, the sort of second level of risk-taking that I would say uh, um, is, is worth honing. And is it just a general insight as opposed to a technique to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that's really valuable advice. I've certainly benefited from something along those lines myself, you know, being out of a job for a while and then just waiting and waiting and waiting. And I, every month, actually, I would sort of check in with myself because I, I didn't want to think about it all the time, but I'd check in with myself and be like, should I start looking for a job now, like more actively rather than, you know, opportunistically sort of seeing what, what happens. And every month I was like, no, no, no. And then, you know, after a certain amount of time passed, I looked at this this sort of reminder that asked me to see if I wanted to look for a job and, and I had one because something had come in that was just like so obvious that I just had to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it took several months or actually over a year sort of waiting to to see that thing come in. And I think it's just super valuable. So highly, you know, endorse endorse that point of view. Um, exactly. You talked about, you know, when, when you quit poker, you didn't just quit poker and try to do the next thing. You actually really hit the reset button and gave all of your money away, you know, save maybe $10,000. Um, I'm curious about that decision, how you decided to make it. Obviously that's like a pretty tough decision and an unpopular decision to make. Um, on the one hand, it sort of takes away your safety net, which I think I read something a long time ago. I don't even know if, you know, where it's from or, or how true it is or whatever, but it, it had proclaimed that like acrobats actually fall significantly less when there's no safety net. Uh, just sort of knowing <laughs> that it's there is like, I see. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I think you sort of did some form of that. And then there's also sort of like, you know, you probably didn't have much of a money motivation at that point. And money is just a very natural motivator. Even if you're not a money oriented person, it's just like, you need a, some amount of money to do the things you want to do. And so 
you sort of reignited that motivator, I think, but I'm curious what was behind that and, and how you look back on it now. It's a, it's a great question. And I think it's maybe hard to, it's maybe hard to square with the fact that like the things that I've been doing in my life obviously are very deeply connected to money. So I was a professional poker player, which literally, you know, you're playing a game with money. Uh, I'm now an investor, which is, you know, I'm investing money. Like almost everything that I do is about money in some sense, but, um, but it might be hard to square with the claim that actually I'm not very motivated by money. Um, I live pretty simply. I don't spend a lot. I don't, you know, have fancy watches or cars or anything like that. And um, I've never wanted that. And I think actually at a young age, I learned very viscerally that um, the, the disconnect between money and happiness. And not only did I notice it in myself, is that like, okay, I made money at a young age uh, and didn't make me happy. And, but I also saw it in the people around me. I saw a lot of young poker players make a lot of money very quickly. And I could see very clearly that they were also not happy. And uh, you learn that money is a tool. Money is, is a tool that gives you some things and can't give you others. And, um, and so when I, when I uh, walked away from poker and, and, and gave away eventually the money that I made as a poker player, a lot of the, my motivation for that was one that, um, you know, I, I didn't want to be somebody who, you know, I guess sort of, I, had, I had this vision of myself of me being in like an office somewhere, unjamming a stapler and imagining like, man, I used to play high stakes poker a long time, you know, like having this sense in which what I was, what I could accomplish in my life was eclipsed by this, 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 uh, the, 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 the progress that I had made and the success that I'd had at, at, at a very young age. Um, I knew that that would, that would stunt me that would make me less capable of doing what I wanted to do with my life, uh, if that's how I felt. And to your point, you know, it's also, it's also very much the, the acrobatics thing, is that um, I knew that if I wanted to really force myself to become successful and to reinvent myself and to do something with my life that I could be proud of, that uh, I was going to need to need it, not just want it, not just in the abstract, like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I blah, blah, blah. It's like I needed to know that I had no other option. And, um, and that, that's what drove me. And it was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. And, um, you know, wh when I came out to Silicon Valley and got into the tech industry, uh, part of what motivated me, and, you know, I, I, there, I went through a long time of trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do with my life. And I, I was very unsure for many years. And um, one of the things that motivated me was I came across a movement called effective altruism. And effective altruism, it's, it's a kind of panoply of ideas. And, uh, but one of the core takeaways is uh, one of the strategies to having maximal impact in the world is what's called earning to give. And that's actually something that Sam Bankman Freed from FTX has now become sort of minorly famous in his own way, uh, also subscribes to. And it's the idea of uh, if you want to have maximal impact on the world, one of the best ways to do it, well, not, not the only way, but one of the best ways to do it is to make a lot of money and then donate that money to high impact charities. And the idea is that by doing that, you can actually have more impact than you could yourself. So if I were to go, let's say, you know, go work for the Peace Corps, um, you know, I could, I, could, I could potentially do that. I don't know that'd be amazing at it, but I, I could do it. Um, and I would have some amount of impact. But if I go instead, uh, go into a high income earning career and then take the money I make and donate it to fund you know, five people to go work in the Peace Corps, I can actually have more impact than I could myself. And that idea uh, really resonated with me because at, at the time I, I wasn't planning to go into something that earned a lot of money. Um, but uh, th this idea just totally made sense to me. I was like, yes, that, that's right. Okay, great. How do I do that? What's the, you know, to my earlier point, like, okay, I, I, I agree with this argument. I think this is a way that I can really have an impact. You know, uh, the money that I'd made as a poker player had very little meaning to me uh, back when I was a poker player because, you know, when, when you're playing poker, uh, money is just chips, right? It's like the, it's like the points in the game. It's, it's how you win. It's how you lose. It's how you get to play the next game, which is, you know, play in higher stakes and play with better players. Um, but the money itself, I was like, look, I, 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 I'm not motivated by this. Um, I don't care intrinsically about the money and, um, it's just like a nest egg, right? It's like a, it's a reason to sit around and not do anything because I don't have to. Um, and, uh, it was, it was when I came upon the notion of earning to give that, uh, I realized like, look, I, I think I could be good at this. 
I think that if you put me into a situation where I have to use my wits and my abilities to succeed in some competitive endeavor and make money, um, it's probably one of the few things in the world that I'm really good at. And uh, can I do it again in a totally new field? Uh, I thought so. And that's what ended up bringing me out to come to Silicon Valley and take down the path that I have. And so since, since that time, uh, since I started in, in Silicon Valley, which is I think about uh, seven years ago, um, every year I've donated a third of my pre-tax income to, to high impact charities. And I hope to continue doing that uh, over the course of my life. It's, it's a large part of what gives me motivation to keep, to keep doing this and to keep grinding and keep working hard. Um, but it's also the one thing that I think also keeps me grounded that what I'm doing is not bullshit. It's very easy to feel that uh, in a lot of endeavors in life, especially when it comes to making money, but uh, also you know, when it comes to crypto or technology generally, you, know, you look around and see the state of the world and you're like, man, why am I doing this? Like, what is the point of this all? And um, there are a lot of stories that you have to tell yourself about why you're doing what you're doing. And sometimes you buy those stories wholeheartedly. And other times you lose confidence and say like, is, is it really true? Is this really making the world better? Is this really you know, the future of finance or the future of the human race? Um, you know, good days, I, I swallow it wholeheartedly on bad days. I'm like, shit, I don't know, but it's the one thing that I know I am doing that I'm having an impact on the world. Uh, and that is for me, a lot of my North star when it comes to what keeps me motivated and, and uh, driven to, uh, continue trying to operate at the highest level. Yeah, I think obviously that's a, that's a great thing that you're doing. And, uh, you know, people, I, I've had a bunch of people on the podcast who are sort of in and around this effective altruist movement. And I think that uh, it just seems like there's, I don't know if it's because there's sort of overlap with crypto or something, but it, it seems like that crowd is becoming more prevalent and there's more people who sort of believe in it and, and advocate for it that are um, gaining influence. So I, I think I'm sort of optimistic about, you know, to your point, not everyone needs to go and work for a nonprofit to make a difference in the world. And maybe with, with more focus and more resources on this effective altruist movement, uh, we may be able to, you know, people with money may be able to spend it in ways that are uh, more effective on, on actually doing good in the world. Uh, I'd be remiss if, you know, we went this whole conversation without touching on crypto. Uh, <laughs> we, we have so far, but uh, yeah. quickly on, on Dragonfly in particular, um, Again, you know, you guys just raised six hundred fifty million dollar fund that'll enable you to do quite a bit more than you've done to date. Even and it was, you know, hundred million off the bat and two hundred twenty five, I think, for your second fund. We're no small numbers, but now you can just, you know, escalate that up even even up a notch. Um, I'm curious, you know, one one thing that stood up from for me uh, from your website and uh, just reading up a bit on you and everything was, uh, first of all, the website translates to Chinese in like the bottom right corner. And on the homepage, it says global from day one. So it's clearly like this, you know, there's nothing else on the homepage, really. Um, so you guys are like, you know, it could be like decentralization is, is, you know, the point or like you could have anything on there and you have like global and you translate to Chinese. Maybe I'm reading too much into things, but you also uh, studied modern Chinese history, I think, and learned Mandarin a little bit. Uh, I'm curious, like, <laughs> if you could just sort of elaborate on this international focus and if there's a China specific element there but just what's behind all of this uh, global focus. Yeah, so, to, I mean, to be clear, I'm definitely not an expert in Mandarin. My Mandarin is pretty crappy, but it's, you know, good enough for somebody who's not, uh, you know, I'm good enough to be cute at the dinner table, let's say. Um, so our, our fund, um, in the early days, in the very beginning of the fund, uh, back when crypto was kosher in China, uh, China was a big focus of ours. Um, we've, we've actually, we've been an early investor in, four of the five unicorns that have come out of Asia in crypto. Um, so we were seed investors in Amber, seed investors in, which I think they just raised a 3 billion, seed investors in Matrixport, which raised over a billion, seed investors in Babel, which raised uh, 2 billion. Uh, we led the Series A of Bybit, which is one of the largest exchanges in the world today. Um, so we've been very early investors in a lot of the important platforms that have come out of Asia in crypto. Um, but of course, you know, I'm you know, here in the US and a lot of our team is based in the US. And so, they're, they are kind of the two centers of gravity of crypto is Asia and the US. Now, uh, since last year, when China enacted the crypto ban, um, a lot of that activity has migrated out of mainland China into Singapore, right? So it's no longer kosher in mainland China. Um, and so we, we are setting up a home base there. You know, I, I was just in Singapore a couple months ago, 
Um, and I spent a lot of my time there and a lot of our team spends our time there. So our view, broadly speaking, is that crypto is a global phenomenon. I mean, the whole point of crypto is that it's borderless, permissionless, decentralized, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you, if you look at crypto Twitter and you spend most of your time trying to imbibe what the Anglophone community thinks about crypto, you'll get this impression that it's really about the US or it's about America or it's about whatever. Of course, you know, America is a huge part of the market, um, but it's not the only part of the market. Crypto is a global phenomenon from, by, by, uh, from inception. And uh, to ignore what's happening in Asia, which by most definitions is actually the largest market for crypto. Asia has more trading volume than the US. At most of the largest exchanges in the world are in Asia, they're not in the US. Um, you know, most of the enterprise value is in Asia, not in the US, even most of the users. If you look at whether you look at exchange users, so owners of crypto, or whether you look at, you know, Web3 users, actually, if you look at MetaMask, uh, MetaMask users, which is the largest Web3 wallet, the US is number three by country in terms of MetaMask users. It's not even, uh, it's not even close to number one. And so that, what that tells you is that uh, crypto has always been global, but there are very few firms that actually are able to cover the full picture, that can actually really see the full elephant of what crypto actually is on a global scale. And that's what we try to do. So we partner with uh, the, the best entrepreneurs, both in the East and the West, let's say. Um, everybody in the team is global, everybody in the team travels. We're also pretty technical in our DNA. So you know, I'm a technologist by background, uh, more than half our team is technical. And uh, I think that puts us in a pretty unique position within crypto to try to cover what crypto is doing on a global scale. Uh, and um, it's core to our DNA and, and we, we intend to keep doing it as long as we can. Yeah, it's great. And uh, I, I know like sort of the funds, uh, or, yeah, the funds team at large, but, you know, led by yourself and, and the other managing partner, it's you guys have been able to sort of develop some pretty interesting perspectives and and ones that, from my view, sort of go against the grain or at least sort of novel in, in their presentation. So one you did recently was the blockchains of cities. Um, we'll sort of skip over that here because we're running up on time and you did a great segment on Bankless about that. I'd encourage people to go listen to. Uh, another one, though, was on decentralization and why you thought, you know, decentralization was not the end all be all, um, you know, it was critical for Bitcoin success, but it's not necessarily critical for your crypto startup in XYZ space. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And then uh, if you do get to the point where you talk about sort of the S curve of it, I'm curious if there's sort of another level where, um, you know, Bitcoin, I think, I'm not sure if you would argue, but I think there's certainly some people who would argue that it's it's still not 100%, right? Like it could be attacked by a sufficiently large force like a government or a three-letter agency or something like that. Is there another level of the S-curve that can be attained which sort of surpasses that? Uh, that's one question I have on it, but would appreciate your sort of overall download on, on your thoughts on decentralization and, and why it's maybe not as important for some projects as, as people think. Yeah, so decentralization is kind of, we, we now see it in crypto as being this primary virtue. You know, it's, it's like, uh, it's almost attained a religious quality within crypto discourse and crypto culture. And anytime that something becomes borderline religious, uh, it's, you, you start having to be very, very careful about what gets smuggled into the concept and where the concept is actually useful and where it's now being cargo culted. And my view broadly is that decentralization as a concept has gotten so untethered from its core usefulness that it's, it's, it's imperative that you kind of take a step back and really try to think from first principles. Why is decentralization important? Let's not just blindly assume that decentralization is important for its own sake, because I don't believe that's true. Um, decentralization is not a... Um, it's not a direct goal, it's an indirect goal, meaning that the reason why we care about decentralization is it gives us other things that we actually care about, right? So another way of saying that is like, why is Bitcoin decentralized? Bitcoin is not decentralized because decentralization is this great thing and it's, it's, it, what it means to be virtuous is to be decentralized and therefore Bitcoin is the most virtuous. It's not what we, that's not why Satoshi made Bitcoin decentralized. Nobody gave a shit about decentralization before Satoshi decided the way to make Bitcoin work was to make it decentralized. Now, what do we mean by make it work? What we mean is that the two properties that Bitcoin needed to be decentralized for is first, censorship resistance, and then two, the uh, censorship resistance, meaning that nobody could take down Bitcoin and nobody could stop somebody from being able to use the Bitcoin network. 
right? Um, and then second is legitimacy, which is that when something is decentralized, uh, it, it makes people feel that this thing is reliable and it's legitimate, meaning that it's not going to change in a way that is inimical to its overall goals. Um, it's it's very, you know, sort of very likely to be robust and, and to stick around and kind of do the same thing. Um, and people view the, the code, the infrastructure, the, the principles behind this thing as being fairly arrived at. That's what decentralization does. That's why it's important. So now the question is when you're starting a startup, right? Let's say you're doing some random NFT project. Um, and you say like, oh, your thing is not decentralized enough or it should be more decentralized. We're gonna do all this work to decentralize it. Um, what is the decentralization giving you? Right? What is the actual end thing that you care about? you're getting out of decentralization? And the answer oftentimes is, I don't really know, you know, the answer is sometimes like, I want people on Twitter to stop yelling at me. And that's why I'm going to make this thing more decentralized. Um, but in reality, your biggest problem is probably not censorship resistance, nor is it, uh, you know, some, some notion of legitimacy. Uh, very often, people are just making things decentralized for its own sake, because they think that this somehow makes things more virtuous. And now, I, I, I give this notion of what I call the decentralization S-curve, which is this idea that decentralization is also not linear, meaning that more decentralization does not always lead to the same outcome, right? There's some, there's some degree of marginal analysis you need to do to say at the margin, if we make this thing slightly more decentralized, how much more value do we get out of that? And the answer actually changes based on where you are on the decentralization curve. So if you are, um, you know, if we, if we think about decentralization in terms of how it gives you censorship resistance, then let's say that you are, you know, uh, let, let's say let's say you're a new layer one, okay, and your validator set is extremely centralized. It's like all your friends and service providers who you, you know, your investors, right? And they're the ones that are running all the nodes. Um, so you might say, okay, this thing doesn't look very decentralized. Meaning that if if you know if the core team said, hey guys, let's like turn off the blockchain today, everyone would turn off the blockchain. Uh, but if you start decentralizing the validator set then very quickly as you start decentralizing and bring in third parties who are not connected to everybody else, um, that very likely is going to increase the censorship resistance very drastically, right? So just adding five independent parties to your validator set really significantly increases the ability for the core team to just say, hey guys, we're totally changing everything now today. Uh, there would be more likely to be a revolt. There would be people who would stand up and say, no, 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 I'm not supporting that new change. Um, that makes a big impact. However, as you start, you know, you, you decentralize the validator set, you decentralize the, um, the, the code base, you like you create a process around blah, 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 you do all the stuff that makes it so that there are multiple clients, there's multiple teams, there's blah, 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 blah. Now you start saying like, well, even after we've done that, still like there's, you know, the mining pools are like kind of, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, there's like only one block explorer and like that's not decentralized and there's only one this, and there's only one that. And you start going down the list of things that you are going to complain about, about not being decentralized enough. And as you quote unquote decentralize more of those things, you just get less bang for the buck, right? Like actually it wasn't the case that now the core team could just unilaterally change things and influence these, uh, influence the blockchain. But to your, the point you made earlier, if a nation state or an extremely well-capitalized attacker decided like, hey, I want to shut this thing down, they can still do it. Right, so even if you add the second block explorer, it doesn't change anything. I mean that still the team can't do anything, and the nation state can still break you. And so there's a there's a diminishing returns past a certain point of decentralization where you stop getting very much bang for the buck. And when you're thinking about what is actually the biggest problem that this blockchain needs to resolve, um, oftentimes the answer is not decentralization. And it's an obvious point, but it's one that I thought wasn't made very articulately by most people in the crypto community. And so that's why I wrote up a piece uh, kind of describing this argument in detail. So then on, on that point with the S-curve that I sort of hinted at earlier, is there another level where you think that it would probably be Bitcoin or possibly Ethereum, but another level that can be attained in terms of decentralization and probably the overall value that, that it would not be attackable anymore, not feasibly at least? So I suspect that actually not, I actually suspect that it would not be Bitcoin, but rather Ethereum that would be most robust against a nation state level attack. Although it depends on how you're imagining this kind of attack, right? So let's say that, let's say that a nation state wanted to take down Bitcoin. Uh, well, nation states have the resources to be able to 51% attack 
a network uh, the size of Bitcoin. So, I mean, I, to be clear, I, I can find no conceivable reason or circumstance under which they would want to do that. But let's say that they did. In principle, it'd be doable, right? You could acquire enough of the stake or you could bribe enough people or whatever, or sorry, not the stake, but the, uh, the mining machines uh, in order to make this happen. And certainly as the block reward gets smaller and as the Bitcoin happenings take place, which means that there's just going to be less hardware pointed at the same hash rate, that it will be easier over time to crowd out the Bitcoin hash rate and to 51% attack that network. Now, you know, what's the motivation to doing that? I don't know, unclear. You like short Bitcoin and you make a little bit of money, maybe. Um, so I, I don't think that is super compelling. Now, for Ethereum uh, in proof of stake land, it's actually much easier to fight off an attacker because of the fact that uh, if somebody is, is uh, attacking a proof of stake network, uh, they're attacking it with money that exists inside your network. And so if everyone agrees, like, hey, we just saw that like, you know, North Korea or, you know, some other, you know, rogue actor is trying to break our network. Well, we can identify their stake. We can see their addresses on chain and we can just go fork and delete it. We can do basically what we did in the DAO fork, um, except, you know, do so in a punitive way against the bad actor. And that is something you can't do with proof of work, right? You can't go delete other people's hardware, but you can do it in proof of stake land because the quote unquote hardware is stake. So that is one defense that Ethereum has, at least in a pro, post proof of stake transition that Bitcoin does not have. Uh, however, the, the flip side of that, of course, that Ethereum is more centralized and that there's a more muscular team that's involved, right? So like if a nation state, you know, wanted to go after the core team, um, it would be in principle easier to do that, right? I, I mean, there's no single person that if you went after Bitcoin uh, could really materially have an impact on the value of Bitcoin. Uh, but of course, there is a at least one single person for Ethereum for whom that would be true, which would be Vitalik. So that is a, a very real sense in which Ethereum doesn't have today the same threshold of decentralization uh, or the resistance to nation state level of tax at, as Bitcoin. But I think eventually um, there's a good chance that it can get there. That's, that's very interesting. It's, a, it's not a perspective I've heard before, but I've always, you know, in crypto, I think it's just largely assumed that, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, these things are just you know, basically risk proof. Um, but there is some small risk there that, you know, whether or not you think it's going to come to fruition, it's sort of worth acknowledging in some cases. And I hadn't heard the argument that Ethereum, it actually may be lower for the reasons you just illustrated. I think that's interesting. Uh, but I know we're coming up on time. So I want to thank you, Haseeb, for, for coming on. And uh, it was awesome, you know, reading everything that you've written and listening to you on other podcasts. I highly recommend people go and and check them out but uh awesome now being able to talk with you after all that and and i, I really like your perspective on on crypto and, and life at large so uh it's been great where can people go and uh you know follow your story and and dragonfly and, and everything you're doing here forward so the easiest way is just to google uh dragonfly capital you can find our website and then uh we link to a lot of our research and writing um and then just follow me on twitter so uh just google my name haseeb h-a-s-e-e-b uh and you'll, you'll find me and Give me a follow and uh, see what you think about what I do.